Oh boy, it's certainly taken me a while to get around to doing this. Welcome late oh. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Primus Academy World History. When we left off, uh, humanity was born, and we just started doing agricultural stuff. We were on the road to civilization, and ladies and gentlemen, today, we are going to be talking about the dawn of civilization. So agriculture comes in, changes society quite significantly. The world population begins to grow because agriculture provides for a larger and more reliable food supply. Though some people don't exactly settle down into farm societies, uh, there are still nomadic pastoralists who travel with their uh, herds and crops. They ranged over wide areas and kept herds of livestock for foods and items. However, other people took on to having settlements. They abandoned the nomadic lifestyle and began to farm and pull their labor and resources and created the early farming societies. I wrote these notes a long time ago. I'll be honest, I am almost just reading off of this and this is a refresher for both you and me. So uh, I apologize, but the show must go on. In early farming societies, people lived close together in houses made of mud, bricks, and other materials. Uh, they had crop and livestock around, uh, around, uh, around the home. Oh boy. Some people lived so close together that there actually wasn't a door to their house. Uh, it was really like a complex of buildings where you would climb up onto the roof and climb down through a hole in the roof to get inside your house. Uh, this was mostly in places like Turkey and the Middle East. As populations grew in these settled societies around these farms, uh, they eventually became villages and then eventually towns. So you're starting to see how people are s settling together. Before you used to have like maybe families. Uh, living in a certain area, but now multiple multiple people are coming together. And by 6000 BCE, there were villages and towns of up to several hundred people that were now around the entire world. Now, one of the after effects of the agricultural revolution was a difference in social status, um, and trades made cities more com or societies more complex. Uh, in these um, societies, people would gain more wealth and therefore more influence over others. Uh, while others would take positions of authority to oversee projects like planting, harvesting, uh, building walls for defensive purposes. Uh, typically, men did the heavier work in stuff like farming uh, because they were more able, generally speaking, to partake in that heavier work. And as a result, uh, because these positions held more power, uh, we start to see an element of men gaining more power over women in these agricultural societies. So that sort of was birthed with the agricultural revolution. During this time, religion starts to be formalized with, as opposed to just like, you know, we'll give food to dead people. Uh, now we're seeing structures being built specifically for the purpose of religion. Uh, these, uh, these Neolithic societies, and if you remember Neolithic means Stone Age or New Stone Age, built the megaliths, huge stones for burial or spiritual purposes. People began to worship gods and goddesses that were associated with animals or elements, while other societies began more ancestral worship. Or veneration might be a better word for it. Now that we're having a reliance on resources that you know, are bound to the land, wars begin to become more frequent, uh, fighting over resources and land. Um, people are more dependent on farming, which means if crop failure happens, like in bad weather, uh, good luck. With people living more closer together and more closer together with animals, diseases begin to increase. Um, some animal diseases begin to cross over into humans because of the increased contact between humans and animals. Uh, diseases like the flu, measles, and smallpox begin to make their appearance in the human scene at this time as a result of the agricultural revolution. However, it wasn't all bad. The new tools were made during this period to help make life easier. Uh, hand tools, hoes, sharpened sticks. Uh, by 6000 BCE, people were using animals to help with the farm, uh, like pulling plows, which allowed them to till larger areas and make more crops. Uh, people were using clay to make pottery, uh, and these pots could be used for storing stuff like grains and oils, but also for cooking. So you're seeing all these different possibilities come up with the agricultural revolution because you have more possibilities. People are getting wool from goats and sheep, and that's helping them create yarn and blankets and clothes. You know, we're getting clothes as opposed to just wearing a hide of an animal. Now, at some point, around 3000 BCE, people are using metals. Uh, first, copper, and then a mix of copper and tin called bronze that was better than stone. And it's around this time that you see the transition from the Stone Age, out of the Stone Age, 
and into the Bronze Age. Is my mic recording? Okay. I recorded a video earlier and the mic just stopped working, so I hope that doesn't happen here. Civilization could possibly... It, it takes a while for civilization to develop out of these societies, um, especially because of how hard it is to live during the Stone and Bronze Age. For example, uh, one close step towards civilization in 8000 BCE was the city of Jericho, built in the Middle East. It had a massive 30-foot high stone wall with watchtowers around the town. It's, around, it's the time period where a lot of people were still living as nomads, but people in Jericho, in the first walled town known to exist, required engineering skill, planning, leadership. Uh, it sat near the Jordan Valley on oasis. It's an oasis in arid land, so it has a spring for continual water that the inhabitants really rely on. They were they were able to grow barley and wheat and herded sheep and goats. They traded across the region. It Jericho was really a good starting point to develop not just from a society but into a proper civilization. But something went wrong in 7000 BCE. The city is abandoned. The walls are gone. Many different societies would settle down in the ruins of Jericho, but it would never develop into its own civilization. Chetal, Chetal, Huyuk, Chetal Huyuk is a city in Turkey. By 6000 BCE, it had around 5,000 to 6,000 people. It was more than 30 acres long, and it was the largest Neolithic site archaeologists have found. There are crops around the village, they raised sheep, goats, hunted wild cattle, fished in the nearby river, and traded with people as far away as the Red Sea. They built very close together, uh, built their buildings close together, so there were few, if any, streets, and they entered homes through roofs, roofs, whatever, like I talked about earlier. These homes typically had one main room to live, and then two side rooms, typically for storage and stuff like that. These houses had shrines, they had places for cooking, uh, crafts, for sleeping. And these homes were covered in paintings, as you see a growth in art at this time. We can look at an example of a Bronze Age sort of dude, uh, Otzi the Iceman. He was found in the Otzo Alps. He was a frozen body uh, who was preserved for around uh, 5,300 years old. He's from the Neolithic era, so this is more Stone Age than Bronze Age, actually. He had clothes made from three types of animal skin, which were uh, stitched together, leather shoes padded with grass, uh, and a woven grass cape, fur hat, and a backpack. He had a deer deerskin quiver with arrows and a flint dagger, an axe with a copper blade. Based on heavy wear on his front teeth, it was suggested that his diet included coarse grains. And most believe that he didn't actually live in those mountains, but just happened to be there. And he had an arrowhead in his shoulder, suggesting he was murdered. Dun dun dun! But Otzi the Iceman is a very interesting case study, because we have pretty much a preserved body from the Stone Age, which is intense. More information about this transition to society. Farmers developed irrigation systems and developed networks of canals and ditches that linked their crops to waters link their crops to water, uh, which allowed them to farm more land, and allowed them to farm in drier conditions. They're really, these are really just hacks, you know? We're hacking into the geography and science of the world to increase our power. This is like those people in Minecraft that figure out how to make generators. They could produce more food, and with more food, you have a surplus of food, which is revolutionary for society. A surplus of food supported larger populations, Fewer people needed to farm to feed the population because there was enough food to go around, and people were able to work full-time jobs rather than just farming all day. Uh, if you were skilled with making tools or weapons, you could spend all your time on all your time on that. And so you see people like weavers, potters, and religious leaders. This division of labor emerges in these uh, prehistoric societies. Around this time, there were traditional economies based on custom, tradition, and ritual. Uh, most farmers relied on trade for raw materials, but now villages could focus on making valuable trading products, and leaders can now make decisions based on fueling trade and feeding growing populations, which results in a shift from a traditional economy to a complex economy. Villages will eventually grow into the first cities, uh, which will be larger and more densely populated. The first known city is uh, Uruk, Uruk? One of those is right, uh, between the Tigris and Euphrates River. In 3000 BCE, Uruk was home to 40,000 to 50,000 people and covered more than 1,000 acres of land. These urban populations were more diverse. While villages were typically extended families or clans, um, cities included many unrelated people. 
Uh, cities needed a more formal organization with a defined city center. Uh, palaces, temples, monuments, and government buildings and marketplaces typically were at the city center where everyone went to do their business. There were defined boundaries for these cities, which meant that they needed walls to protect it from the outside world. The existence of large walls meant you could do large-scale building projects, because if you can afford to build walls, you can afford to build larger buildings. And when you have a large number of people in the city, you have more people to work in the labor for these projects. While cities were a large center of trades for merchants, uh, they were farmers in surrounding villages that exchanged goods for raw materials. So, we've seen the farm, then we get the village, then we get the town, then we get the cities, typically near rivers. It's from the cities that we're going to get wider civilizations. Civilizations had several things. They had developed cities, uh, with which served as political, economic, and cultural centers uh, surrounding areas, uh, for example, Ur and Uruk. Okay, I guess I should address this. There are about one, two, three, four, about four places that major civilizations developed. The River Valley civilizations. Uh, they developed around the Tigris and Euphrates River in the Middle East, or Mesopotamia, which means between the two rivers. They developed in the Nile River in Africa. They developed around the Indus River, around what would become known as India. And they developed around the Yellow River in China. Those four areas were, were really like the cradle for civilizations in those regions. Uh, a lot of other human, human civilizations spread out from those areas. Although places in like native in, in, in the Americas, they would really try to stick towards their hunter-gathering societies. Very few would develop farming, but by the time they developed farming and developed larger civilizations, uh, it's not we're out of the era of the river valleys. You know the. Um, the Americas are kind of slow to adapt to that, and Australia for that matter. But the Middle East and Europe will come out of the Mesopotamia stuff. Uh, out of the Middle East and kind of Europe, we have the Tigris and Euphrates Valley. Uh, in Africa, we have the Nile, India, the Indus, China, the uh, Yellow River. The cities of Ur and Uruk developed in the Tigris Euphrates, Memphis developed on the Nile. Uh, Mohenjo Daro, that's definitely not how you pronounce that, is in the Indus River, and Anyang is near the Yellow River. These cities would be the basis for civilization. Organized government civilizations had. Governments were built out of these early regions and made irrigation systems, which, which required planning, decision making, and cooperation. Uh, early governments were made out of the needs for these projects. Uh, they created laws, established justice systems, supervised food production, and building. Uh, they gathered taxes and organized defense while religious leaders held power and other influential uh, elders, warriors, and families held power in other areas. There were formalized religion in these civilizations, ceremonies, rituals, and other forms of worship. Uh, they gained the gods' favor by performing rituals like sacrificing animals and offering gifts of food. Large temples were built, and there you could participate in ceremonies to honor the gods. Priests were the will of the gods and became powerful, and the priests and rulers often clashed for power. Leaders claimed that they ruled by the will of God, or they represented one of the gods on earth, um, which led to a very connected religion political structure. There was specialization of labor in these civilizations. You had tax collectors, engineers, 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 planners, soldiers to defend the walls, architects, construction workers uh, for temples and roads, artisans developed their, devoted their time to their craft, and trade merchants. Social classes developed in these civilizations. They developed based on occupation, wealth, and influence. Typically, you had rulers, priests, and nobles at the top, with merchants and artisans usually below. Uh, below that were farmers and unskilled workers, and that was the majority of the people. And finally, enslaved people were serving at the bottom. Typically, slaves around this time were captured in war or sold to slavery. So, you either had debts, or you were an enemy soldier captured in a war. That's what the slave society was built on. Civilizations had record-keeping and writing. Uh... In complex society, there were needs for record keeping, like taxation, and for merchants to keep keep track of their stock. Uh, the civilization of Sumer uh, kept clay tokens and pouches to keep records, and the shape and markings of the tokens represented specific items. Five thousand years ago, writing was developed with pictographs, images that represented ideas. Advanced writing would eventually be used with abstract, system, uh, abstract symbols to create a wider range of ideas. It was with the written word that uh, we really transitioned from prehistory to history. 
Calendars were created for farming purposes, so you could know when the season was and when to harvest. Uh, the annual flood would happen around this time. I guess I should reference why. I thought this would pop up in my notes, but it actually didn't. But this is the key point. Uh, these civilizations were built near rivers because these rivers flooded annually. What resulted was silt and stuff from the bottom of those, those rivers ended up on the land around the rivers every time there was a flood, which made that area really fertile for agricultural purposes, which is why we can see the development of huge cities since they can create big farms to support larger populations. That's why civilizations developed around these rivers. I can't believe that's not in my notes. That's like the key point here. But calendars were created so you could know the seasons and know when to plant and know when the annual flood would happen. For the most part, these calendars were based off of the moon, as opposed to the sun, which is where our calendar comes from. Art and architecture developed in these civilizations. Uh, each society had their own style. Uh, statues, paintings, gods, heroes, rulers. Bronze was often used. Uh, they would adorn city squares and public buildings and royal tombs. Monuments of rulers often reflected of civilization's power. So we already talked about how forces of nature easily destroyed the crops. Uh, the need for resources led to wars and expansion. With all this, with trade and merchants and wars, people spread and traveled. Um, travelers learned new languages to trade with foreign groups. Migrants brought language, customs, and traditions with them. Uh, civilizations put their own culture and imposed it on the conquered civilizations. And this is really where we get cultural diffusion, how elements from different cultures spread to a different culture. Cultural diffusion is a big common theme in human history of how different groups influence other groups and create stuff that wouldn't be recognizable to their ancestors. Also through cultural diffusion, technology like writing would also spread. So that's how you see similar technologies develop in similar civ or in uh, uh, close by civilizations. Religions spread with gods being adopted. Civilizations conquered and took land and people. And eventually, as these civilizations got more complex with their conquest, they would develop states and kingdoms to administer, administer everything and develop their own identity. Meanwhile, there are still nomads chilling out there. And while the, uh, the nomadic pastoralists were still loosely organized into tribes with chiefs, uh, but they were sort of toughened because they needed to defend their herd. So while everyone's living out in the cities getting soft, these nomads are like, you know, punching bears, keeping them away from their cattle. So they become sort of rougher people. Uh, but once they domesticate the horse, all of a sudden they have a huge larger range for their influence. Nomads and settlers would trade stuff, and sometimes nomads would launch raids on village villages and cities. So there would, be, there would still be conflicts between the nomads and settlers over land purposes. But the main, the main point I want you to get out of this, because I know this episode was kind of scatterbrained, was uh, with agriculture, people settle on riverbeds because they create the most fertile soil, and it's around those four regions that we get the first major four civilizations. Uh, what would eventually become the Egyptians, the Middle Easterners, the Indians, and the Chinese. Um, with Europe kind of spreading a bit out of the Nile, a bit out of the Mesopotamia region. And with civilizations, you develop common cultures. And now we're getting big culture groups. The next few episodes, I'm going to go from civilization to civilization. We're starting with Mesopotamia, then to Egypt, then to India, then to China. To see how they're developing in this, you know, early Minecraft server. I'm sure some of you who love Minecraft have seen that there are a lot of a lot of uh, comparisons that can be drawn. But thank you guys so much for watching. I hope the next episode of Primus Academy World History is actually focused and I, I have a more clearer idea of what I'm trying to say because a lot of that, a lot of those notes were rep, uh, repetitive, rep, repetitive, rep, repetitious, repetitive, that's it. I haven't spoken English in a while. Thank you guys so much for watching. Subscribe to this channel if you have not yet for more Primus Academy. All my links to my social media are in the description below. And uh, yes, have a great day, ladies and gentlemen. Join the Discord server.